I'd like to call to order the City Council meeting for Monday, September 19th. And uh, to start off, we do have uh, Zane, who is here, a Boy Scout, who uh, I've asked if he would come up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So those of you wishing to join us, please rise. Oh, it's the 26th today. Sorry, I read the wrong sheet. It's September 26th. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Zane, before you run off, if you would please come up to the podium and tell us your name and your troop and what you're working on this evening. I'm with Zane, and I, I'm Zane, and I'm with Troop 76, Marvin Chamberlain's group. And I am working on my community service badge, which is my citizenship badge. And I'm, one of my requirements is, is that I must attend a city council meeting. So that's what I'm doing. Great. Well, thank you for being here this evening, and we'll try to make it super entertaining for you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's a thank tough you. requirement. <laughs> we do have a quorum of the council. All seven members are here this evening. Mr. Pike, do we have any amendments to our agenda this evening? Mr. Mayor, we do. Uh, we would like to, to add a, another executive session. So uh, a, se uh, a session under uh, 74-2061-F, which is to communicate with legal counsel for the public agency to discuss legal ramifications of um, and legal options for pending litigation. Thank you. And my understanding is this issue has come up since Friday. And so that is why it was not noticed on an amended agenda on Friday. So I would uh, entertain a motion to amend the agenda. Suzanne Hawkins. I move to amend the agenda to keep the, or to add the um, executive session under the session that our deputy city manager referenced. Second. A motion by Suzanne Hawkins, seconded by Don Hall to add an executive session under uh, Idaho Code 74206-1F. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes, reluctantly. Greg Landing? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you, Mr. Pike. We have no proclamations this evening, so the next item on the agenda is general public input. And if I, I could ask one of the staff to grab the sign-in sheet, please, for me. This is an opportunity to uh, address the council on items that are uh, not on this evening's agenda. Related to matters relevant to the city of Twin Falls. So we do have a couple of folks who have signed up. So first, uh, we have Terry Edwards. And I would remind everyone to please come forward to the podium, uh, state your name and address, and whether you're a resident or property owner in the city of Twin Falls. And we will limit our uh, input tonight to three minutes per speaker. My name is Terry Edwards. I have property in Twin Falls. Um, I just wanted to commend the uh, council for last week's decision to waive the uh, non-conforming building permit expansion process for Mr. Herring. I thought it was an appropriate thing to do in the situation that was there, and common sense prevailed. So thank you for doing that. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. And next we have Lee Stranahan. <coughs> Welcome, Mr. Stranahan. Thanks very much. Let me just, uh, I'll be talking about technology, so of course mine isn't working. Here we go. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. I'd like to uh, talk about something that's uh, it's also related to something I talked about last week, uh, based on Mr. Rothweiler's uh, presentation at the Economic Development Meeting uh, uh, about 10 days ago. Um, and I want to talk about the role that I think the city can take in dealing with internet infrastructure and what I'll call a digital infrastructure issue. I'm going to talk about the issue briefly, broadly, and then I'll make a practical suggestion. Uh, right now, Twin Falls, I just checked this uh, today, ranks 
about 3,500 on a list of about 5,000 cities in terms of internet speed. Uh, this needs to change for a variety of reasons, but specifically to achieve some of the goals that Mr. Rothweiler and people like Josh Palmer addressed at that economic development meeting. Goals like attracting young professionals and just as importantly, retaining young people in Twin Falls so when they graduate high school and college, they stay here rather than going to places like Portland, Seattle, or the Bay Area. Um, now, at the time, I brought, I, I raised the, the issue, and Mr. Rothweiler mentioned, I think properly, that a lot of this stuff is handled by private companies. And I think that that is appropriate, but I think that there is a step that the city council can take as well. The first step is recognizing that there is a problem. In other words, it is an issue that can be improved. And setting some big goals, not just to make it moderately better, but the next generation of internet technology, forgive me, is almost here, gigabit internet. And that's important for things like 4K TVs. Right now, if you go to Costco or Walmart, you'll see 4K TVs. They're cheap and affordable. That requires much more bandwidth than even the current infrastructure. So practically, my idea here is let's get some of those private companies together. Let's set a goal from the city council to make this a priority. Get those companies together and then ask them, crazy idea, then ask them what do they need? What do you need to make it bigger? Do you need a bigger pipe coming in? Are there, are there technologies we don't know about? Um, I think this should be something that the city should consider as a priority because in a very real way, the future of Twin Falls depends on it. That's my time. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Those are the only two folks who signed up to speak to the council. Is there anyone else from the public who wishes to address us this evening? Seeing none, we will move on with the agenda to the consent calendar. Council wishes. <coughs> Suzanne Hawkins. I move approval. Second. A motion by Suzanne Hawkins, seconded by Greg Lanting to approve the consent calendar. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Under items for consideration, the first is a presentation of the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting received by the City of Twin Falls for the Comprehensive Audited Financial Report, or the CAFR, for the year ended September 30. 2015 and Mr. Rothweiler is on the agenda for that but he is tied up in an interview right at the moment with candidates for the library board so I will turn it over to our deputy city manager Brian Pike. Mr. Mayor if it would meet with your approval could we uh, Slide move that down to yeah, item two? You bet we'll do that we will we'll hold off on that until Travis is able to join us. Uh, number two under items for consideration request to approve the professional services agreement with Civil Science Incorporated to develop the 2016 City of Twin Falls Transportation Master Plan and authorize the mayor or city engineer to sign the contract. We have our city engineer, Jackie Fields. Welcome, Jackie. Good evening. So um, I'll briefly recite part of the background from the agenda item. So uh, we made it, city staff made a decision to um, seek uh, proposals for the Transportation Master Plan in the event that um, there was a larger opportunity out there. Um, we received four proposals. Uh, the evaluation team proceeded through the proposals and um, made a decision to select Civil Science Incorporated. Um, so we came to Council last week and Council approved the priori prioritized list. And uh, because we're nearing the end of our fiscal year, we jumped right on negotiating the scope of the contract. Um, much of the contract is uh, similar in scope or was already known to the proponents as they developed their proposals. So um, the transportation master plan is going to be very similar to water and wastewater <coughs> facility plans in that um, there are certain technical analysis type things that need to happen. You need to look at um, what is currently happening. You need to make projections for the future, develop a capital improvements plan, and some estimates for that. So those things are not dissimilar from the last time that we 
did our transportation master plan and are scheduled to occur again. Um, we, we do have some things that are different. Last time we didn't have a pavement management plan. This time we do, that we've been trying to use and have been augmented, and augmented this year with um, a LIDAR contract that did some analysis on, on more streets. So we have some more data points. And, um, and we also have transitioned to ISPWC. So there's been a, a difference in some of the way that we um, are going to be addressing paving um, and uh, road load. The ISPWC suggest, well, a materials report in advance of ISPWC's implementation suggested that the city consider a roadway alternative called minor collector or major collector. So, you know, it's a new, a new subcategory. It allows for roads like locusts to be treated differently than roads like shoop. Okay. So we need to um, qualify shoop. Is Shoop's a, col a collector? Shoop is a collector. Holy okay. Crap. So it's, it's not the same kind of road as locust or Fillmore, and, um, nor does it need to be built in the same way that locust and Fillmore need to be built. So this will provide an opportunity to get the pavement, um, to keep the pavement right, to get it right. So um, we also have a pretty robust public inclusion process um, because we, uh, we need to talk about um, things like uh, pedestrian ways, illumination standards, we need to deal with truck routes, um, and whether or not we should have them. Um, we need to deal with um, some impacts to the development community. You know, for instance, this uh, business of looking at where collectors uh, should be major and where they should be minor is something that we could do in a vacuum, but we don't function like that. And it's probably better to talk to people about um, why we would want to classify a road in a particular way and how it actually serves the public in the long haul. So um, uh, we also know that we're going to be facing within our next um, time frame uh, becoming a, our next uh, revision to the transportation master plan should be just in advance of when we are designated as a metropolitan planning organization. So we've started doing planning, making planning efforts to uh, talk about that. There's been a transit plan out there. Um, there's been some investigation. We need to um, do a little bit more. And so this plan will include some steps that we may choose to model. Um, as we as we move forward, um, so I think that um, I'm going to stop speaking, unless you would like me to add more information about any particular sector of the transportation master plan. I think the only item I would add is that also as part of the evaluation was the public engagement process and how how the general public could plug in in perhaps a less technical way in helping to address some of those issues as well. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a plan to uh, use some more modern tools. You know, surveys are pretty easy to do. Um, response by telephone is or using your devices very attractive to many people. So um, we're going to attempt to ask certain types of questions in that way. Obviously, capacity analysis questions don't need to be dealt with in the more modern um, methods of gathering information because they're a technical analysis. But you know, when we're having discussions with people about pedestrian ways and, and incorporating the draft bicycle plan into the transportation master plan, those are really good times to hit up um, folks that don't n normally read the newspaper, for instance, and to try other methods. Thank you, Jackie. We do have a few comments or questions. Greg Lanting. Uh, I guess I'm having, I, I absolutely agree that the minor major collector, I guess I'm having a little concern. Uh, maybe I didn't understand how collectors work because you mentioned Shoop, and it's one block away from a major arterial and another block away from what I assumed was a collector be, being Haber. And so how does Shoop end up being a collector? So collectors are traditionally placed on quarter mile roads between the mile. So I believe that even though Shoop appears to be one block, um, that it's a long block. 
Okay, so no, between so. between Falls and Addison. Oh, you're right. I apologize. It's Hayburn. Hayburn. Okay. There, now, the now, now that makes sense to so, me. All right. Thank so, you. So, you know, when we're dealing with developments, I always whip out the plan. I yep. just want you to know that. I always okay. look at the plan. It's always good to look at the plan. I'm no longer confused. Thank you. Chris Talkington. Jack, <clears throat> two questions. Uh, one, will this incorporate at all our mass transportation, the bus route system? Will that have any involvement? Uh, with so the, the work that's been done on preparing for a transit plan will be incorporated into this into document. That. Okay, it won't so have to be reinvented then. No. Okay. No. And also, a couple of years ago, we <clears throat> tried to get some momentum going. There was interest on reconfiguring East Five Points to allow trucks coming through Kimberly Road to uh, go straight through on Truck Lane instead of up East Main and doing their goosenecks. <clears throat> Is that still something that can be done or is that uh, outside the purview of this this type of study um, when it has a place in this document so the the discussion on what to do with Washington 6 and Minidoka absolutely has a place in this document and um, the transportation master plan <laughs> needs to prioritize uh, that project as something that's of community interest when I made the submittal um, last January for local urban funding. That project was not specifically identified in our transportation master plan. And um, there was a deduction on the score that was significant because of it. So um, it, it, it should be in the document, and it will be. And but I then it have to get I, on a funding cycle on uh, so very long it, range. We will not finish the transportation plan in advance of the next funding cycle. So there are opportunities to adopt a value that's determined along the way into the transport, existing transportation master plan in advance of having the new one come out. So we'll be able to remedy our particular situation in the short term, but in the long haul, um, if the community values that um, discussion and investigation on six in Washington, Minidoka, that area, then we need to have it in our transportation. Well, I sure hope plan. it doesn't. Uh, it, it doesn't deserve to be deep six. The, the wear on Main Street, uh, the inconvenience of traffic, uh, slowing down to trucks coming that should be able to shoot right through to <coughs> the south end of town. It looks like it should be a higher priority than we've given it. He said. <laughs> Don Hall. I just piggyback on to what you just said, the Minidoka 6th issue with trying to get the uh, seconds um, off the highway route around there. I would hope that there would be a lot of discussion during this for that direction as well. Just keep that on the front burner as well. Nikki Boyd. Mr. Mayor, if you're ready for a motion. Suzanne, did you have a comment? Oh, question first. Okay. I'm sorry. Yep. So, Jackie, can you briefly go over um, the pay scope on this? I know that it showed that the 250000 was the same as the last study, roughly, and then in the contract it breaks it down between three separate entities. So we're contracting with Civil Science, and they're, and they're contracting with the other two, and that's how we came up with that fund, or how does that work? Help me. So I estimated the what I thought would be a reasonable amount of money for a professional services contract um, based on what I understood from the scope at the time. Okay. And then as we moved through the scope discussion, we, the, the rules for professional services contracts means that we talk about the scope first, and then we have a discussion on what that correlates to um, financially. And if we cannot come to an agreement on the scope and the finances, um, you know, typically there could be some back and forth, and then um, we could uh, make a decision based on how well we could meet that scope. So the subcontractors for um, civil science have um, developed an estimate for the amount that they're going to charge civil science for the level of work that they anticipate to occur. And so we don't usually uh, negotiate the actual subcontractor scope. We negotiate with what civil science is going to do. So um, the way that I do this from my experience in the olden days is that um, independently of 
what the contractor, the, professor, the engineer prescribes. I do a man day estimate or a man hour estimate, a per personnel hour estimate for the type of labor effort that I think is involved. And I estimate what type of person would probably work on that, whether they are a technician or a clerk okay. or so on. Um, if my number is within 10% you know, of their number, we're in pretty good shape. So we're just negotiating with civil science, and then they take care of the rest, so we're not entering into a contract with all three companies. That's, that's accurate. Okay. Civil science will be held responsible for a robust public there involvement we go. program and for appropriate capacity analysis. Thank you. Uh -huh. If that was what you were originally asking, I apologize for the long-winded answer. I, I did not you. ask it very well. No, you did great. Thank you. Nikki Boyd. I move that we approve the professional services agreement with Civil Science Inc. to develop the 2016 City of Twin Falls Transportation Master Plan and authorize the mayor or city engineer to sign the contract. I'll second that. Motion by Nikki Boyd, seconded by Ruth Pierce to uh, approve the professional services agreement as presented. Is there any further discussion? Chris Dawkins. I think it uh, is appropriate we attach an upper amount on this. Rather than just signing a, a document without the specified amounts, it was 249, wasn't it? 249 and change. I would so move to uh, include uh, with the contract up to whatever the, it is, 249. What did you say, Susan? It was. When I, I closed that document. It was 249 and change. It was just under 250. Just Not to exceed 250. Yeah. 250. Jack, yeah. Jackie I'll has second. the number. Oh. We'd like to get it from her. Okay, the number is 249 982. So amend. Second. So a motion by Chris Talkington, seconded by Don Hall, to amend the original motion to include the not to exceed amount of 249982 dollars. <laughs> Actually, the wording was up to. Let's hope it comes in significantly less. Tens of thousands. <laughs> Is there any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. So the amended motion to approve the professional services agreement with the up to amount of $249,982. Any discussion on the amended motion? Sharon, roll call vote, please. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lantin? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. <coughs> Jackie, I believe you also wanted perhaps some input from us on folks to serve on the Technical Advisory Committee and the that would be great. Indeed. Would you like to do that now or at a later meeting? <coughs> do we have a little time to work that out? As I'm you, sorry? Do we have a little bit of time to do that? We have a little bit of time. How about let's put that on an upcoming agenda as you finalize the agreement? That's fine. And in the meantime, we'll all put some thought to who we think might be some good types of people to serve on that Thank you. committee. Thank you, Jackie. We're going to go ahead and go to number three so that Jackie can get through her item and then we'll back up to number one. So item number three on the items for consideration is a request to award the contract for the sludge truck for the wastewater treatment plant to Jackson Group Peterbilt of Boise, Idaho in the amount of $138,665. And again, our city engineer, Jackie Fields. Okay, so the engineer, engineering department initiated a formal bid and received two bids. The first was from Jackson Group Peterbilt of Boise, and the second was by Rush Truck Center of Twin Falls, Idaho. Uh, both bidders had exceptions to the specifications. As required by the contract, Jackson provided supplemental information to justify their exception, and their exception was found to be to at least meet the specification. Um, Rush Truck Center had three exceptions. Um, the documentation was uh, 
not sufficient for us to make a determination that they were at least the specification and we felt those those specs had to do with the structural strength of the vehicle and we felt that they were important to maintain and so um, we are suggesting and recommending that the council authorize The mayor to sign a contract with Jackson Group Peterbilt of $138,665. Uh, the price difference for the record is about $1,700. So they were very close bids. Chris Talkin. So move. <coughs> second. So, Go ahead. A motion by Chris Talkin and seconded by Suzanne Hawkins to award the contract for the sludge truck. To Jackson Group Peterbilt in the amount of $138,665. Suzanne Hawkins. Thank you. Jackie, what was the exception and what was the conclusion of that? Okay, there was so one the, irregularity. The, what? The exception on Peterbilt was mm -hmm. um, we asked for uh, steel and we were getting aluminum, but we were getting double sided aluminum that actually exceeds the minimum strength required. And then at least two of um, Russia's exceptions had to do with um, strength. So um, the modulus and, and, the, and the moment of the, how this um, vehicle is going to um, be formed so that it doesn't buckle under the load. And it was uh, somewhat close. You know, it wasn't like it was way far off, but um, it did not meet the spec. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Seeing then, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Barriker? Yes. Chris Talking? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. So we will back up the agenda to item number one under items for consideration presentation of the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting received by the City of Twin Falls for the Comprehensive Audited Financial Report. The year ended September 30, 2015. We have our City Manager, Travis Rothweiler. Well, Welcome, good Travis. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council. Sorry, I apologize for being late. I had the opportunity to sit on library board applications and interviews and uh, some really phenomenal candidates that uh, we'll be bringing to your um, uh, review for, for ultimate uh, consideration and, and possible appointment at an upcoming meeting. But tonight we get the opportunity to really celebrate one of the achievements of our finance department that has taken several years to, to reach this step. And this is a really significant step in terms of our organization in turn by what and how we start our budgeting process and you've heard us speak about the importance of the budgeting process how we open that process up for lots of citizen input we start that process very very early and we continue to move forward and that budget is really a best plan that we hope to carry forward and to move forward. It lays <coughs> out our goals and our purposes with the public resources. But at the end of the day, a report card is important. How did you spend those city dollars? How did you honor your fiduciary responsibility? And part of that is an audit, but the other piece of that is a comprehensive annual financial report, which is much more involved than just a simple uh, audit and, and process. It is a complete description of what occurred inside of the City of Twin Falls from not only a financial but policy perspective. And the City of Twin Falls is now one of three entities in the state of Idaho that has received the GFOA's award for most distinguished budget and the GFOA award for the uh, Comprehensive Annual Finance Report or CAFR. And with that, I would like Lori, Shane, and Brent to come forward, and if the mayor could come down, and we will present the first um, comprehensive annual financial report from GFOA, um, and then I would like Lori to kind of talk, and, and Brent to spend just a few seconds talking about the steps that they took 
from 2011 forward to get to this point. Nice job. So just for the record, those three other local government entities inside of the state of Idaho are the city of Boise, the city of Post Falls, and the city of Twin Falls. I believe the city of Post Falls and the city of Twin Falls received that recognition uh, for both of our works in 2015. So we're tied for second, if you will, um, <coughs> in terms of <coughs> moving that forward. But our documents are far superior to what Boise does anyway, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> So I would just like to say, um, before I turn it over to Brent, who really leads the charge, that there are a lot of folks involved in this. Brent will tell you that the auditors were part of that team that made it all happen, adjusting their reports so that we fit in to what GFOA wanted. Brent leads that charge for our team, and there are a lot of members of our team who prepare schedules and, and help make it happen. And I will say Travis is part of that as well. He sets a high bar for us. So. So this is really a great achievement for not just our finance department, but the whole city. And Brent can share a little bit more about it. Well, I think the finance department really should be proud of this. And I think one way to evaluate um, how significant this award is, is by letting you know that we made two previous runs at it and failed. And uh, these are reviewed by professionals on a national level our financial statements and they came back each time and said here's why you didn't make it here's the critical things and so we would address those we took run the second year and didn't make it again and uh, you know our, our, our auditors or any auditors if you say we want a CAFR they hate that <laughs> because because uh, it is difficult to achieve that not just to do the CAFR but to do it in an appropriate way where you um, are able to receive the award and so we're pretty proud of this I have to say that. And our auditors did a, a super job of uh, team approach on making it happen. Thanks. Thank you, Brent. Chris Toggins. Hey, Brent, could I uh, ask a silly question? We try, pride us, try to pride ourselves, or pride ourselves, I guess, on our transparency and our being squeaky with, uh, with taxpayers' money. But how would we sell this to the public if uh, failing a couple times and we made it now? What do you think this relates so, to, uh, might, to the public? Sure. That might be a... Um, you know, I don't want to give the wrong impression, because financial statements and the audit report have been sailing clean for years and years and years. Right. And what this is, is it's a, it's a higher level, and it's pretty much uh, formatting and presentation uh, to meet the professional standards. Uh, so our financial statements, what went into this financial statement is no different um, than what's gone in in previous years. It was just the uh, whipped cream and the cherry that went on top of everything else that, uh, you know. I'll let you to sell it to the <laughs> taxpayer that way. I'm yeah. Just, we have higher expectations and standards yeah, internally uh, that may not be visible to the public, but we can sleep better at night. Yep. Whether yep. or not we have cherry pie with whipped cream. Yeah. On <laughs> Thank you. So someone might ask, why do you, is, is the award important? And I think the award illustrates the recognition of the team that the staff goes forward with. But it's really the process involved that I think is the most important. Um, when you look at what uh, the Government Finance Officers Association sets as those bars like Brent was talking about in terms of what do you report, how do you report, um, if you take a look at past budget documents, you would see that they were lots of line items. And you would ask, what are we getting for those services? And what does that look like to our taxpayers? And what is the rate? And what is the cost? And, and you really have to dig through the numbers to understand the numbers. <coughs> what we're trying to do is to make sure that everybody who wants to have knowledge about how this government spends money has access and the ability to understand it. And I don't know if that answers the question, but really what we're trying to do is present financial information that can be complex, that can be difficult to understand, that can be laid with rules, 
in a manner that everybody has a clear understanding of how their tax dollars and their u and their utility rates are being allocated for the public purpose. Thank you, Travis. Greg Lanting. Travis, I just a comment coming from another public agency where I prepared the budget for my middle school and the transparency <laughs> and the um, time we spend on making sure each and every one of us understand it. I think maybe that's the reason, and the public as well, understand where we're going, where we're coming. Because I came from a school setting where you didn't know most of your budget until the legislature got done, and then you had to have it done basically by the time school got out. So you had about a month to say, to figure out what you were going to spend, what you were going to spend it on. And then, of course, towards the end, they just didn't give us any, so it made it pretty easy. But uh, the legislature, I mean, and then I'm never sure how we ever figured out what property taxes we're going to have because we had to decide that by July 1st, and we don't even know until August, usually, right. where we're at with property taxes. So uh, I agree that uh, our, our process, not only the transparency part, because we didn't have time to have the public involved. We truly didn't. And to the process that we follow here where we start in early in the year, and uh, sometimes it gets, as Sean said the one time, do you want us to repeat this <laughs> portion of it? Because we pretty much haven't memorized parts of it by the time we get to the actual public hearing. And then we have a public hearing every night ever that we talk about the budget. And I can't see how it could be any more transparent or uh, our attempts to involve the public are far past what schools have the ability to part of to make. Thank you, Travis. Well, I would just say to Laurie and Brent and Shane and all of your team and all of the folks on the city staff and I think the efforts of the council in wading through all of that too and, and uh, getting up to speed on that, um, I think it is definitely a service to our community to make sure that we are being uh, stewards of the public trust and the public resources. So congratulations. Well deserved. Next, we have an update on the City Hall Public Safety Complex design process and a construction update. You're, you're not Mitchell Humble. <laughs> busy tonight. <laughs> we have our Deputy City Manager, Brian Pike. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of the Council. Tonight I'm playing a series of roles. I was Travis <laughs> earlier, I'm Mitch right now, and just in a little bit I'll be myself <laughs> under item five. And Really speaking of these two items, um, if, with, with the Council's approval, as we move forward, we'd like to actually present both of these items together. Uh, they really run uh, together. And we've got a fantastic team here in Clint Sievers from Hummel and uh, Michael Arrington from Star. So I think I'll turn it over to them. So I'll just for the record then say we're going to take the update on the City Hall and Public Safety Complex design process and construction update and roll that in with uh, uh, the ultimate action of a request by Star Corporation to present a proposed guaranteed maximum price for the public safety campus project. Taking just a moment to get the uh, technology up and running if you're we're close. watching online <laughs> and wondering what we're doing sitting here. Um, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, thanks for having us tonight. I'm going to give you a little update on um, your projects tonight, the, the new city hall project and the public safety as well. Um, more so on the public safety side with regard to the GMP and moving forward into construction, but I wanted to give you some updated information on City Hall as well since we're here. So um, I'll move forward with that. And um, I'll ask Michael to just jump in. And if you have any questions regarding the City Hall, the way we'll go through this is the City Hall first and then the public safety side of it second, and then end with action on the GMP. So, But if you do have any questions on City Hall and the budget, uh, Michael can step up and answer those. Um, so as far as design goes, with regard to the City Hall, um, 
as you know, we've gotten farther in the process. The design's kind of settled down. Last time we were here, we showed you the exterior uh, renderings and how they've evolved materials and those types of things. Um, the, the floor plans have adjusted a little bit. And if I can get this to move. Um, really what we've focused on is the evolution of the floor plan and the workflow with the different departments in that, in that floor plan. Um, it's, as you know, from programming all the way through construction, it's quite a process and things change from time to time. So we like to um, keep track of that and continue the conversations with staff and the departments and the city leadership to understand how they, how they work, how it's evolving, how they're growing even as we're designing. And part of that is the furniture involved. Um, we've done some really extensive work on how the furniture actually fits within the spaces. Um, so what you see in front of you is the first floor plan of City Hall. And one of those spaces being uh, utility billing is in this, this part of the floor plan. Um, you can see the L-shaped desks laid out here. You can see some front counter space to, to meet the public as they came up to utility billing. Um, those stations as well as um, it's really more evident on the second and third floor where there's more staff. But on the second floor, you can see really a lot of workstations, and um, both for present and for a little bit of growth. Um, on this side of the floor plan, as well as the back in the offices, and then on this side. But through programming, we built that book, if you remember, that's an inch or two thick of all this data of you know, how much storage do people need? How, mu how much desk space do they need? And then we kind of shelved that as we worked through the building and the code and the envelope and um, the rest of the bigger picture items. And now we've kind of come back to reabsorb what that means and make sure it's still relevant. Um, and so, same goes for the third floor, uh, where there was probably the most change in the, the staff and the departments on the third floor um, really had a pretty collaborative um, work environment to begin with, uh, but they took it to the next level and evolved to more of an open office. So what you'll see is really this this large area, a third of the floor plan is just all open office space. Um, what that did is it made our mechanical systems a little more efficient, you know, it was a little bit less, less in the way of construction, but I think it really created a cohesive work environment for finance, HR, administration in this regard. Um, and so you'll see the consistent lobby, restrooms, elevators, stairs that we've had in the past. Um, but simply within those, those departments, the barriers kind of came down, and now they're going to function as one big open space. Um, certainly comes with its challenges. What we've done is we've mitigated those by adding a few smaller conference rooms. Um, people, uh, when they need a little bit more privacy, they can go use those rooms, or if they need to meet with two, four, six people, there's rooms available for that. And so you'll see those throughout the floor plan. Um, in this area, there's a couple here. There's a little phone room here. Um, and then, of course, our large conference capabilities, the executive conference room, those other larger conference rooms are still there. So, um, Same goes for IS. Um, they're up in this corner. Um, furniture systems, they've already got some of those. If you've seen them, the electric desks that go up and down. Um, so we'll probably relocate those into this space, but also um, add to as they need for their staff. And then um, the other thing I'd add is just the growth um, shelled space that's continued to stay there. So I think that's really a good a good thing that you'll have eight to ten thousand square feet in this building that you can still grow into in the future. Um, so what I wanted to show you from a design perspective is just well, I'll go through. Can I ask a question on City Hall? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you bet. Uh, I hope we are still planning to take <coughs> advantage of uh, advanced in technologies for inner office communications. I think I mentioned publicly before, investigate Li-Fi so we minimize any hard wiring. Mm -hmm. uh, this might not fit in quite here, but uh, I hope that we're not constructing any impermeable walls that would not allow us to take advantage of that 
high technology. Right. Yeah, we have kept that a priority, sp All right. specifically too, like when you mentioned the public in the council chambers, right. um, with regard to that technology and the systems. The approach we've taken there, um, not unlike the conference rooms or other workspaces, we know it's going to change. Whatever we design for today is going to change. So, keeping that flexible and, and designing conduits or, you know, um, permanent structure that's going to prohibit you later, we're, we're trying not to do that. So, yes, that's still a Thanks, Glenn. For sure. Um, and so, I wanted to run through the floor plans and then I'll show you some furniture that the, the city's actually going to demo. Uh, the police operations building really hasn't changed. You'll, you'll notice this is the existing plan on the left that we presented last time. The plan on the right-hand side is the newer floor plan and um, really, really has stayed the same since the last time we presented it to you. The administration has changed some. Um, if you'll remember the, the plans in the past, we had some center corridors similar to the way the building was previously um, and then offices on the sides. We did have a little bit of open office area, but um, the folks in the police department have come back and said, you know, we really, we're, we're buying into this too. We'd really like to see this open, open office workspace. Um, and so it, it doesn't come without its offices. There's certain specialties as in narcotics and um, child crimes, officers, those types of, of uses that still need a room. Um, but this is the basement level um, in the building, and, and if you've been over there, you can see really how that's opened up and how much daylight floods that basement. It's really pretty cool. Um, but, but the way they're going to organize is through furniture systems, um, have all the detectives out in this open area, and then the ex existing concrete columns would fall down in between. So something that's different from what we showed you last time. The main level where the public enters and uh, where records exist and the interview uh, uses uh, really pretty much stays the same. The records department in the past had always been a pretty open environment with furniture systems. That's going to remain the same. And then on the upper level, um, lieutenants' offices, sergeants, the, they elected to go the same route. So you'll see the columns you can kind of see in here. Um, but these walls will all go away and we'll come in with furniture systems and just be really open daylit space. We have kept conference rooms, work rooms, restrooms, break, that kind of thing, obviously all enclosed and private, and as well as the chief's office up in this corner. So any questions on, on PD spaces? <coughs> So I talked to Travis about this, and uh, I don't know if he's visited with you folks, but that section that it used to be the old um, billing, and uh, uh, so you've got the two sections here, and then this section over here, okay, mm -hmm. that's just the one floor. Uh, I was looking at that, and I mentioned it to Travis, and I don't know, make, maybe to Michael, is there a way that we can shore that part, of, since it's all gutted out now, shore that part up? that we could put a second floor to that someday or is that a dumb idea or is that I mean square feet is always needed we'll need more probably when we move in so do you know what I'm talking about I, they, I do we probably best to answer that as a team okay uh, we absolutely could we're, we're not budgeted for that currently and haven't fully studied that but it's certainly possible yeah, that, I, I just asked the question before to see if that's a, a possibility, what it would cost. Um, again, uh, since it's all gutted and opened up, if you're ever going to do that, yes. now's the time to do it, correct? That, that is correct. And that looks like to me to be 3,000 square feet that we could add, two or 3,000 square But But maybe it's cost prohibitive. I, I don't know. Well, it is cost prohibitive in that we've not budgeted for that throughout this time we would certainly gain the, the square footage um, but we need to we need to find a way to, to pay for that now we'd, we'd also some of the other ramifications of that is we, we tap the brakes uh, on, on the project in order to get that sorted out um, I'm saying that that's the, the wrong thing to do but um, we would need to, uh, to to give you a number that was that was accurate 
we'd need to do some more studying on that, but it's, but it's definitely Well, well I, and again, I don't want to put anything in the way of our progress. That's why I asked a couple weeks yeah. ago about yeah. this. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I do know that when they built the original mm -hmm. police department, we were told that we were going to be able to build another floor someday. And then later on, they went in there and said that it wasn't structurally built to, to do another floor, yeah. which was too bad because that would have saved, that, that would have really helped with this whole process anyway if we could have put another floor on the main building. So I'm just asking the question. You bet. That's one of the troubles with, uh, with making a plan, designing a structure to potentially handle that upgrade someday. When someday comes, often the way that we analyze things have changed enough that we're no longer able to take uh, full advantage of that uh, that that future planning, but in, in order to gain that, or in order to gain that, it would be I mean, it, it would be several hundred thousand dollars in order to, to do that work. Um, to assure the the ceiling up and to add yeah oh. to turn that into a well I wasn't saying to put the second floor on right now it's just a question again well, sure. I, I'm just kind of uh, throwing a monkey a yeah, monkey yeah, wrench yeah. in here and I, I I don't mean to do that that's why I asked a couple weeks ago Not a, no no I I certainly understand that. Um, I guess that would be my thought is that if, if we were to go in and do that now with the possibility of doing that in the future there there's a high likelihood that when we get to said future date whatever it is that we did may not work work d d depending how the building was analyzed at that time anything to add to that yeah, I, can, I can add to that you know we have we've got that question in the past um, with other types of projects and older buildings. Oftentimes what we found is when we study that is that the square foot cost for that construction like that becomes so high that it's burdensome and it's actually better or more efficient to go elsewhere and expand. Okay. Given that block, as you know, and I know that's why you're asking the question, it's tight as it is. It is. Um, we've actually, when we did the program, we, we explored a couple of options for expansion that, that could help you in the future. We didn't have any costs associated. We really didn't have a program to go with it. But what we did is we studied the, the parking lot, what could fit, if it was a potential garage someday with an addition of the ops building. Um, I think cost per square foot for your building, you'll get more out of it that way than if you're to go up over okay. existing. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> So, any other questions on floor plans or design or any of that? I just have a few slides here I wanted to show you. Um, we're, the city's working with and, and Hummel's working with a, a company out of Boise to design and uh, supply your furniture systems for all projects. Um, and so what, they're willing, what they've been willing to do is um, we've gone through some tours, we've had a lot of staff involved. Uh, Mandy Thompson with, with um, Travis's office has worked closely with the interior designer at Hummel, understanding what the needs are and, and aligning with that program book that I spoke of. Um, and they've actually modeled, this is a 3D generated model of the furniture systems that they're willing to demo for the city for an amount of time so that the staff can use it, understand what they like, what they don't like, how much is this, how much would this option be. And then as we complete these construction projects, we can order furniture that fits the need, you know, and then the budget um, and install. So just to give you a little bit of explanation of what this is, they're typical modules. They can come on different sizes. The couple of the options are going to be these desks. We'll have some that are electric that can go up or down. Um, as you can imagine, that stuff gets expensive, so we'll have to understand how that fits in with the budget and maybe who needs them now or who could get one in the future, that kind of thing. Um, some other options, there are the divider storage systems here, um, bookshelves. Um, people's concerns with lower open office environments are acoustics, um, making sure they can have a phone call, not interrupt somebody doing work on the other side of the fence kind of thing. Um, and so these are really time-tested types of systems that have acoustic partitions in between and then these storage systems that actually act as acoustic dividers as well. Um, they have a ton of options as you can imagine that the one we're showing right now has an accent color so Jennifer our interior designer is working with the finishes 
carpets, tiles, all that kind of stuff, and how it can tie in with these furniture systems so it's all cohesive. Um, there's also options with this to do glass panels on top instead of fabric. Um, so if we need to go there, um, people like that versus the, the solid panel, we can do that as well. But I wanted to just show you a couple of the options and explain the exercise we're going through. Clint, there are a couple of lights here. Greg sure. Lanting? Yes. Uh, Back on the furniture and also actually the actually the design of the office as well. Yeah. And you mentioned that in, you have an interior designer. Do they? I the reason I bring this up. I happened to have a conversation with a former classmate in college that is that is her occupation now. She does it for the federal government. She designs the office space and decides what office equipment goes in there and I just wondered if you make advantage take advantage of that same type of a thing or we do um, we have an interior designer at Hummel that's an employee of Hummel that's part of what we do um, regarding the furniture typically what we do is we work with vendors that are local and there's a state contracts list where all of the the furniture is bid uh, publicly and all the numbers are known and competitive so as an agency the city knows they're getting the best bang for their buck in that regard um, but they'll often provide free services for us to help plan. And so okay. um, Business Interiors of Idaho is the one we're working with here. We took staff um, and, and ourselves, and we watched some of project, their projects, some of their competition's projects, um, and then the, the, the lines that they represent more aligned with the budget that we have and, and the quality we're going for. And so that's why we elected to work with them. And so they're just doing this free service. They're planning the furniture for us, and then we can drop those into our floor plans and right. make it work. So, yeah, it's a similar thing. All right. Thank you. Chris Dockington. Another silly question or two, Clint. With this open architecture, <clears throat> sound migration can potentially be a real issue. Uh, I've seen a number of open architectures where they've had to retrofit sound absorbent material to uh, get the DB meter from pegging. Uh, are, are, are we fairly confident with this carpeting? And you mentioned glass panels or carpeting that we we have a standard we're going for sound isolation. I don't know what the correct term is, but you know sure. the concept I'm talking sure. about. Yep. No, nope, I get it. Um, we are. We're pretty careful with that. I've been. I've had a number of projects where we've had um, value engineer items come up and you regret it later because now you have an acoustic issue, right? So um, we're very aware of that. We have an acoustic engineer that we typically involve in projects like this, and he's um, he's very good at giving professional opinion. I can, like the council chambers, for example, I've given him some information and um, you know said the walls are going to be this, the flooring, we're going to do carpet, we're going to have a few acoustic panels on the walls and the, and the ceiling. Um, what is that going to do to us? What's our reverb times like? And, and he'll say, yeah, that's going to work, or no, you better be careful about that. So um, we're, we are being careful with it. We're selecting carpets for a lot of the workspaces. Um, by the time you get bodies and carpet and some sort of um, absorbing panels in the ceilings, um, you've really did what you need to do for those work environments. So Now's the time to worry about it. Exactly. <clears throat> And so I just have a couple other shots here, and then we'll go into schedule. And this is just another option. So regarding schedule for the city hall, and this kind of goes hand, hand in hand with the public safety as well. If you'll remember, we started bidding the public safety, um, what was it, a couple months ago. Um, and the bid market was such that you know, we were getting some high numbers on half the bids, and we got really good numbers on the other half, and so we awarded half of those, and then we went out to rebid. And Mike will talk about, about those in a minute. Uh, but what that told us is that the time, the timing of the market maybe was was pretty busy, and maybe we ought to rethink about the schedule and how that helps us from a bid standpoint. Um, so you'll see originally I, I wanted to pull up the schedule on the bottom of the slide just to show you what we we showed you last time, and our intent was to start construction, bidding in August, September, and start construction September, October. So now we've kind of slid a little bit, and I think 
you'll see here in a minute with our rebid numbers that it's helped us to, to get out of the summer season and into the fall. So that's what that says. Um, our intent with construction documents on City Hall is to finish up by the end of September. So you'll see we're pretty close now and we're getting ready to bid in October. So that's going to be that's going to be really exciting and telling um, if we have a good bid market. Construction would then go from November through November of next year. So the move-in kind of slid a little bit, but um, that's a 12-month uh, approach with the construction schedule. If there's any time we can make up, I think Michael would say we would. Um, but that's just a forecast for right now. Uh, for the public safety campus, um, some of you probably seen we've got the demo underway on the admin building. So it's uh, the first half of the bid packages are under contract and in the works. Uh, the bidding's complete now, and you'll see a GMP, which is our maximum price. Um, the star I'll present in a minute, um, and then the com completion will phase through fall of next year. So we had presented to you earlier. Um, kind of an August to December construction for the admin building, and then a January, February to August for the operations building. That would then follow the same slide that the city hall has taken. I don't. We may be able to finish faster because we've started faster, but it'll follow that same kind of <coughs> lag. So, any questions on schedule and, and how things have evolved? Okay. So this is, can everybody read this okay? This is the spreadsheet, similar format to what I showed you earlier this spring. Um, and what this indicates is a couple of things. The highlighted column on the right is fall of 16. These are our, our more current numbers. So you can see, you know, how we've tracked this. We've used the same format from the fall of 14 where we hadn't done programming to when we did programming and then we got some numbers and it was higher than we expected, so we backed off um, and reprogrammed some spaces. What could we absolutely, you know, live with and put the wants aside for another day? And then the spring of this year, as we started to finish, um, these were the updated star estimates as the spring of this spring of this year. The top number you see on the far right column, this is an updated estimate for City Hall. And if you follow this down, um, really where I like to go is um, down along this line on the bottom. It's close to the bottom, I guess. It's the 9.934. Um, so what that includes is it includes the estimate for the city hall today. And remember, that's an estimate. We're not really going to know what those dollars are until we bid and know those numbers for real. Um, it includes the 3.6 number, and this is indicative of the... Um, GMP number that Michael's going to present to you in a minute. Um, but you'll see the only difference is we pulled the contingency item down below. And so if you look, if you remember this number, it's not going to match one for one with what Michael gives you, but just know it's that plus the contingency is what Michael's going to tell you. <clears throat> so that's the real number for public safety. You'll see the total 9.684 as it aligned to the 9.5 in the spring. Um, same impact fees here, and then the contingency came down. So one thing we do as we progress through this, um, through the whole design and construction process is as STAR knows more information, the gray area or the contingency can get further and further neck down. And so that's what's, ha that's what's happened. So it helps the overall budget in the end. Um, but including the contingency, what we told you last time was this 9.9 .9 number, 9975. Today we're at about 9934, including the contingency. So we're feeling like things are going to come down and they're getting better. Uh, we've worked really hard to get, you know, to stay at that or, or under. So that total number has is, is come down a little bit. We have one item that's new to us about a month ago. Um, some seismic upgrades that we were not aware of that have come to fruition. So um, a little history on that. A year or so ago, when we were doing the initial planning, we had an allowance in the project for seismic upgrades for the banner. Um, 
we hired our structural engineer that, that's been working with us on the project. This spring, I guess, when we started getting further detailed with the estimate, um, we requested professional opinions from them about the structure, about the seismic, and whether it meets code and what we have to add or um, shore up with the building. Long story short, about a month ago, they came back and said, we've done our final calculations, and we need to add significant steel to the columns and beams. So this is an item that's the 228 that you see down here um, that kind of caught us all by surprise. It's something that we have to do. Uh, to meet code, but from a diligence perspective, I don't think we're done there yet. So we're continuing to work with the engineer. We're continuing to work on um, what the code is interpreted as, um, what is the most cost-effective way to solve that, and maybe we can use some design elements to take up, you know, some of the seismic bracing and, and share costs that way. So um, not great news, but. Um, <coughs> kind of is what it is, and uh, we're still working on that piece of it. Thank you, Clint. Chris Talkington. Glad to help me un <clears throat> understand how we can, uh, it looks like, almost arbitrarily reduce our uh, recommended contingency from 475 to, what is it, two, 249? Yeah, really, it's, it's... Isn't that figured on a percentage of project? 5% to 3% is really where that came down. Well, how, how can we just uh, reduce it? Okay. Travis can so I can ask I can answer that question because I asked the same question um, so what was shared with me is that when you're getting into the beginning of the project there are an entire host of unknowns and the more unknowns you have you start with a larger contingency and as they've kind of gone through not only the exposing of the buildings and the beams and the structures they are now more certain with what they're dealing with and so the amount of uncertainty is going down and therefore the amount of contingency that they feel that they need for the project is diminishing at that same rate. So earlier we could not have reduced it uh, to that 3% without get, going through this process and refining that. That's right. So when, okay. when they set the contingencies, um, you have to remember that it was prior to any form of demolition and now that they've exposed the structures, they have a better understanding and they're much more comfortable with not only the bidding environment, but also the structures that they're working to be able to move forward with. I just don't want the thing to bump up to 5%. And again, that's not going to happen, right? Yeah, I think Mike will explain a bit to That's called a handoff to him. He has to answer it. <laughs> Um, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, but I don't want that to be a 5% contingency at yeah. the very end. If we're this right. sure of ourselves, it should be a one-way process to lowering that. That's, that's actually a good segue into the GMP. Thank Unless you. any other further questions on, on this slide, Michael would, would go into more detail on the public safety side and the GMP. Okay. Thank you, Clint. So when we were here uh, about two months ago, we presented a, uh, a similar spreadsheet that only addressed certain packages to get us started on the demolition and certain packages on the public safety campus. As Clint mentioned, uh, those are underway. The demolition is, is pretty well done, and many of the packages, um, submittal work has started on them, and equipment and things have begun to be procured. So tonight we come back with the other part of that story. I've highlighted the ones in yellow that we're presenting tonight. The ones so that are not highlighted, such as selective demolition or masonry, are ones that were addressed at the GMP that we talked about back in uh, July or early August, perhaps. So, so we have good news to report tonight. Um, each of these packages that we uh, rebid either came in under where they were last time. Um, one of the exceptions to that is rough carpentry. 
Uh, we expected that to happen because of a strategy that we switched to um, with the way that we framed the inside of the building. The, the market between steel and wood studs, uh, you know, varies a bit. And uh, that's it's market driven based on materials as well as contractors that are available to perform the work. Uh, currently, uh, wood studs for partition walls uh, is a little less expensive. And so when we rebid this, we acknowledge that and rebid this as wood studs in lieu of metal studs. So that is one of the items that went up, but we expected it to. The, the, op, the, the effect that we see there, the positive effect that we're looking for, shows up in the package number 13, where the metal studs were before that number came down significantly. Um, electrical came down quite a bit. Like I said, all the ones that were highlighted came down quite a bit. There are two packages that we uh, are listing as, as allowances. Uh, the major one there is aluminum storefront. Those are your windows. Um, and we still only got one bid on that. We're, uh, after surveying the market, we're confident that we can get at least two bids on that to make that a little more competitive. And so we have placed an allowance of $80,000 in there and would move forward and would re-bid that package to make sure that we get good competition on that particular item. Uh, some of the, the general conditions items below that have also been adjusted down a little bit as we take a final look at them. They've been adjusted down a little bit based on the guaranteed maximum price that you saw earlier at the 1.7 level. Um, this to, to, to circle back uh, and talk and speak to Chris's question about contingency, there's the $96,000 and change listed there as a contingency. That's calculated on, on 3% and would lock this portion of the project in uh, at a 3% contingency. That would be part of our GMP there as well. Pretty standard practice for us to, to carry about that much and, and there's no, no intention or, or history of going back and suggesting more than that with this level of drawings. So you wouldn't see that from us in the future when we come back to present on this for the City Hall. Um, so <clears throat> to this evening, the figure that you see at the bottom of $3.449 million would be the guaranteed maximum price for both projects combined, not in addition to the 17 that you'd already authorized. The 17 would actually be part of this. So that GMP would be amended to take into account these work packages to bring it up to 34, not 34 plus 17. Are there any questions for Michael? Don Hall. No uh, surprises on seismic upgrades for the police buildings? No. We're confident? We are confident, <laughs> yes. That has been exposed now. Uh, the drawings are in. Do we have a building permit yet? We have a building permit, and we're ready to go. Any other questions? I don't see any. Anything else from you, gentlemen? So we'll let Brian come up and tell us what action is suggested. Well, and I had uh, just to kind of go back a little bit, I, I do apologize. We worked really hard early this week to get this information out, and we were really working under a timeline. We lost the Isla early on, and so it, it limited our ability to get information into your hands. So. I know you're feeling like maybe you're flying a little bit blind, and, and I apologize for that. Um, the staff would ask that you would, uh, the council would approve the STARS guaranteed maximum price for the project, understanding that this includes both projects together. We're not talking about this in addition to anything else uh, for a total of $3,449,493. Uh, for the total project. To, to maybe put this in perspective, um, this puts us at uh, about a $3,000 difference in, in, in the total cost of, of what we thought we would be. And really, the credit goes back to, to Michael, Jason, to Clint, and Brian for really working on this. This was, uh, when we started back with the first series of bids, we were a little bit spooked about how all this would come together. 
And I know between Star and Hummel, they worked really hard to, to, to work on these numbers, to work with their partners, and to get us at a price that we could live with. And, and you know, in a uh, $3.4 million project, if, if we're, you know, we're over by $3,000, I think the team did an incredible uh, job. So that's the staff recommendation. We would stand for, for any more questions if you have them. Travis? I just want to add maybe just kind of to refresh the memory of not only the council but maybe also with the audience. Um, this is a project that we've been going forward with for a while, and so we use terms like GMP. GMP is a guaranteed maximum price. And so what, what we're asking the council to do on this project today is to um, – approve a guaranteed maximum price. And, and when we started the very beginning of the CMGC process, which allows us to build a partner into that process as opposed to going out for a sealed bid project, I think that Brian really talked about that benefit in the beginning. But one of the benefits to the city is we work in partnership, and what that does is that minimizes the amount of risk not only to the city, but also the amount of risk that would be to the uh, general contractor. And so risk moving forward really does fall on STARS' shoulders. Um, and, and what they are saying is, based upon what we know, we are going to deliver a package that has been designed at a price not to exceed um, you know, the guaranteed maximum price. Um, unless we elect to come in and say, you know what, we found something, and then at that point in time, the council always reserves that right to modify that upward moving forward. Um, we think that the partnership has really exhibited itself, especially in that rebid atmosphere that we went forward with. Um, and and, I, and it really, I don't think it can be overstated the amount of work that STAR did to bring this project to, to where it's at today. Now, if there are savings that they realize along the way, the beauty of the project is those savings then are also passed on to the city. So you're not where you normally get a bid and a bid project and you pay a lump sum fee. We're a partner in this in the fact that should there be cost savings, especially in the areas where you'll see uh, project manager, project superintendent, if there are fewer hours that are spent on the job than what's anticipated, the, the city is the direct beneficiary of, of those savings uh, as well. Thank you, Travis. Chris Dockington. Well, <clears throat> it's kind of hand-holding time because I'll, although I greatly respect the competence that you've shown heretofore, uh, this is a big thing to, uh, to swallow. We have to do it at some time, but I, I guess I'm just speaking on my own part, uh, I've got to have some updates on a regular basis on line items to know over and under. I, I don't want to be surprised at the end, either positively or negatively. I, I want to uh, walk this baby through to completion, and one year is too long to go without regular updates. But other than that, I, I think it's appropriate that we've got to make the jump sometime, and it looks like it's... <coughs> How can I say it's a reasonable figure? <laughs> so can we have assurance of regular council updates? Absolutely. How when we can do that as frequently as the council would like that, if you'd like them. And not just on bottom line, but specific to items listed. So monthly? Monthly, quarterly. Whatever the council would prefer, we're happy to provide those updates. What did you say? Quarter. Quarterly to me. That would give us four updates between now and the project being met, or four and a half. Um, so quarterly on, on like, the public safety complex means that you would receive maybe one update. Those are right. going to be some pretty fast projects. Um, might I suggest maybe monthly on, yeah. um, on the public safety project so we can be over – overly communicating on those and then on the city hall project we can maybe start on a monthly and if we progress to quarterly towards the end we can go there as well does that work mm -hmm. sounds good okay. chris talkington well we're ready for a motion i am ready for a motion i would move to um 
accepts a request to Star Corporation for the uh, guarantee maximum project price for the public safety campus project. Is this only the, this isn't City Hall, this is just public safety. Public safety. Public safety. Uh, in the amount not to exceed $3,449,493 American money. Second that. Motion by Chris Toggenton, seconded by Ruth Pierce to set the guaranteed maximum price for the public safety campus project at $3,449,493. Is there any discussion? I would just echo the comments that both Travis and, and Brian have made that I think uh, this process of partnership has really helped us to keep uh, this in check. I think it shares the spirit of being um, frugal uh, and responsible with the public's dollars, and I appreciate all that Michael and your team and Clint and your team have done to um, help keep this in check. There are a lot of unknowns. It's very difficult to predict what's going to happen 12 months down the road 18 months ago. So uh, I think it's been a, a good process and appreciate your diligence and look forward to that continuing through the rest of the projects as well. So with that, uh, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Barricker? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, next on the agenda, we have uh, another opportunity for public input. Is there anyone here from the public who wishes to address the council? Seeing no one. Uh, items from the city manager and city council. We'll do city council first. Anybody have anything? Chris Talkington. <clears throat> Taking more than my share of time to talk, but I just want to congratulate the city and its contractors for the progress on Eastland uh, South. That's a first-class reconstruction, and it's such an important commerce uh, route for us that look forward to its eventual completion all the way down. But it's it's such an improvement now. And uh, I went through there one time when we had some of our infrequent rain, and I don't think we're going to have any drainage problem under that railroad crossing. And I went over that route, I think, every day for about seven years, every work day. And, you know, well, some days, yeah, but mm -hmm. it really looks nice. If you haven't been out there to see our concrete runway, uh, it's worth the trip. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else from council? Did you? Mr. Rothweiler, do you have any items for us? All right. Well, we will move now to uh, public hearings. We do have a public hearing scheduled for this evening to amend the 2015-2016 budget. Have Shane Carpenter here to present that information to us. Welcome, Shane. You, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Um, this is a brief presentation on our budget amendment for this year. Uh, everything on this list would have been presented sometime throughout the year from a uh, member of city staff. Um, so this is really just a summary of everything that we've done for the past year uh, that wasn't included in the budget to start with. Um, so the first one is the general fund, uh, and this is actually from our audit from the end of 2015 was excess reserves uh, that we'd saved that we took uh, to the capital improvement fund. Uh, the second one are uh, police department repeaters, which um, for the comm center, and they used E91 reserves for those. If you have any questions, just interrupt me when I'm going. Right. Um, the second one is a street fund, which is to transfer to the CSI student safety fund, which is the uh, third one down, uh, and that was for uh, the Cheney Drive work that we did. That those were. Uh, repairs and improvements that we did but that were not part of grant um, and that project is almost done. Uh, we had a small little impact fee um, fund charge. Uh, we built an equipment storage shed. We budgeted 114000 and it came in like 117 so that was a little bit of an increase there. And then in the capital improvement fund, um, the big chunk were the uh, fire department, the self-contained breathing apparatus replacements that we got a grant for. Uh, so this is just uh, adding those to the to the budget. Uh, we didn't put them in the budget until we knew we were getting the grant, so now that we got the grant. That was um, the repeaters uh, were from above, from the capital improvement fund, which were just transferred from the E91 reserves. Uh, new cart paths on 5 and 7 at Muni. Uh, 
the VDI boxes. I think Kathy was just here about a month ago to talk about replacing uh, replacing those with some uh, new computers. Uh, the senior center remodeling um, that was 100% funded by grant funds, so there was no cost to us. That was just us uh, getting grant money and spending it on the senior center. And uh, City Hall and Public Safety Complex, uh, we spent about $852,000 uh, this year on that. Uh, so that takes it to about a million four we spent so far in the last couple of years on, the, on those projects. Uh, the airport construction, um, those are a, a small community grant. That's what we get every year. Um, and this year the grant was a little over $21,000. So that's going to be paid on advertising with Delta pretty much. And then the AIP grants, those are just things that uh, will be reimbursed and we just haven't had the money come in yet, so it's not going to hit by the end of the year. So we've already spent the money, so now we need to say that it's just a timing issue. Uh, the water fund, uh, so these are the bond uh, work that's been done. Uh, it's a, just a lot of stuff. It's the Rock Creek lift station, dewatering, uh, the wastewater treatment plant, um, all those things involved with that project out there in the bonds. Uh, Cliff Bar Improvements, this was some work we did at the Jayco lift station for some of the uh, expected growth uh, that's going to come to happen out there. And then Caesars and Restitution, I think uh, Matt came to you guys asking for some reserves out of the Caesars and Restitution for a dog, a canine, and uh, some additional training on that. So. And so that's really what this is, just a summary of all those items that have been brought forward throughout the year. Thank you, Shane. Are there any questions for Mr. Carpenter? Seeing none, we will uh, open the public hearing for the opportunity for anyone to give us input on this uh, public hearing this evening. Is there anyone wishing to speak to the council on this item? Seeing no one, we will close the public hearing and uh, turn it over to council for action. So my question is, Travis, is this an amendment to an existing ordinance and do we need to do the suspension of the rules and all those things we yeah we will need you to suspend the rules um, we ask then you uh, consider the ordinance this evening we'll have a number assigned to it and then we'll get that to the paper and publish it prior to the conclusion of this fiscal year so I would entertain a motion we need the ordinance though it's 2016-11 amended 2016-11 okay no, oh, Suzanne Hawkins. Thank you. So I would like to make a motion that we suspend the rules and put ordinance number 2016-11 on third and final by title only. I would like to second that motion. A motion by Suzanne Hawkins, seconded by Greg Lanting, to suspend the rules and place ordinance 2016-11 on third and final reading by title only. Is there any discussion? Sharon, roll call vote, please. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Sharon, would you read the title, please? Ordinance number 2016 11. An ordinance of the City of Twin Falls, Idaho, amending ordinance number 3105. The appropriate appropriation ordinance for the fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2015, and ending September 30th, 2016, appropriating additional monies that are to be received by the City of Twin Falls, Idaho, in the sum of $11,922,534 and providing an effective date. Be it ordained by the mayor and the city council of the city of Twin Falls, Idaho. Chris Tarkington. Move passage of 2016-11 uh, as amended. Second. A motion by Chris Tarkington, seconded by Greg Lanting, to approve ordinance 2016-11. Any discussion? Sharon, roll call vote, please. Suzanne Hawkins. Yes. Nikki Boyd. Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. And finally on the agenda this evening, we have adjournment into executive session 
Idaho Code 74-206-1B to consider the evaluation, dismissal, or disciplining of, or to hear complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual agent, or public school student. 74-206-1C, to acquire an interest in real property which is not owned by a public agency. And 74-206-1F, to communicate with legal counsel for the public agency to discuss the legal ramifications of and legal options for pending litigations or controversies not yet being litigated but imminently likely to be litigated, the mere presence of legal counsel at an executive session does not satisfy this requirement. Council wishes. Greg Lanting. So moved. Second. Motion by Greg Lanting, seconded by Suzanne Hawkins, to adjourn into executive session under those three sections of the Idaho Code. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Barriker? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. I will remind everyone we will not be coming back into uh, open session following the executive session and we will not be making any decisions in the executive session. With that, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>